to export uh, things, but to enter into a dialogue with the Chinese people and Chinese culture that he learned and studied. Among many other things, he wrote the first Chinese-Portuguese dictionary. It was the first dictionary that had Chinese and the European language, and many, many other accomplishments that we're going to find out and discover thanks to the uh, work of Duilio Gian Maria. Um, we have also a panel that will follow the uh, presentation of the film. I'm going to introduce to you the panelists immediately after. It's a mixture of uh, diplomats and journalists. Uh, we don't have Jesuits on the panel, um, <laughs> but uh, I assure you that uh, two of the people that we invited are alumni of the Jesuits, so they will be uh, represented in a very, very good way. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you um, the Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs of Italy, Stefan De Mistura, who is here with us uh, to uh, introduce this film. Uh, Mr. De Mistura uh, was a top envoy for the UN for many years. Uh, he was in all the major uh, theaters of crisis, um, war theaters. And uh, he's really somebody that embodies a combination of the diplomat and the man of action. That is on the ground when big problems that seem to be unresolvable explode, takes care of them, and most of the time fixes them. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for us that, uh, to introduce this film on Matteo Ricci, a man of dialogue. There is another man of dialogue, who is Stefan De Mistura. So the secretary here. Very kind and a little bit too generous. <laughs> My name is Stefan Mistura, and um, I've been told that in in this country, but normally what you do is when you start talking about something, you should have an anecdote, you know, a little story in order to warm us up. So what I will do, if you allow me, is use a short story which was given to me by a Chinese diplomat of all people. And since we are talking about China and Italy, and in a strange, difficult place like Kabul, in an evening, a boring evening, when we had to be bunkerized. And uh, it's linked a little bit to this. The Chinese diplomat, when he learned I was Italian, you know, in the UN you lose your nationality, so they always ask you where you come from after a while. And he said, well, I read the book. I read the book about... Uh, Machiavelli, you have been writing about it, and the book was about uh, many episodes of Machiavelli, but in particular about his death. Um, and he said, well, you know, this um, is an important uh, period of your life because it, normally you don't have a choice uh, of what to say just before your last chance to talk. So you, and the Machiavelli obviously must have had that thought. The message was the following, Machiavelli flies back with me, he is on his bed, he's old and sick, and the family calls um, the priest. And the priest comes and looks at Machiavelli, who is actually hardly speaking a little bit like this, and tells him, Maestro, it's time to pray. He doesn't move much, but he said, well, repeat with us, repeat with me, what you said when you actually took the confirmation, i.e., 
I renounce to the devil. Repeat. So at that time, Machiavelli turns his head in a last moment of lucidity and says, Father, are you really sure this is the best timing for making new enemies? <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously was a demonstration that our Chinese diplomat had actually understood and picked up that uh, there are Italians, such as Machiavelli, who have actually impressed them about some few things which are part of what today is called realpolitik. Now, Matteo Ricci was the special case. We have only two Italians actually two foreigners, if I may say, who have got a special place either through a monument, and you will see it with the beautiful film that we have made, and which are remembered by the Chinese as symbols of foreigners who did not invade them, who did not intrude into them, but actually helped them to be better understood and better understand the rest of the world. One is obviously Marco Polo, and the second one is Matteo Ricci. He was remarkable for that period and even for today. He was the type of person who had actually done virtually everything. He was a Jesuit, and I'm proud to be myself a student of Jesuits like Elisabetta. It's just a coincidence, but it does uh, have an imprinting like every school we go through. He, and the Jesuits have this capacity of going very much into depths to become highly specialized. It takes them many years. And Matteo Ricci was highly specialized. So he was a Jesuit, fine, but then he became a teacher, a diplomat, a special envoy, and then a linguist, and then a traveler. And traveling at that time, 15, 1500, end of it, was dangerous and complicated. He became a remarkable person in understanding, studying, comprehending the Chinese culture mentality, not imposing anything. And the only time when he actually missed the train, when under the urge of finally delivering what he was meant to do, i.e. convert China, he failed, actually, because the emperor didn't bite. And the theory was you have to go from the top at the time, and then through the top you go down. But it didn't work. And the Chinese emperor forgave him for trying at the last moment to say, okay, I've been studying, I've been working hard here, now would you do me the favor to convert into Christianity? <laughs> and um, he didn't blink. And he ended up that he was highly respected, but did not become the converter of China. You can't do everything. He did what he could, but the reality is that in China people remember him as a symbol of understanding, cultivating, studying is much more important than convincing. Now this is a little bit what we are trying to see among our own, forgive me, Italians in New York or anywhere else, or if you want Americans in Italy. But I'm talking now about the Italians in New York. The young generation I met, thanks to the deputy councillor yesterday, many of them who came to the States because they love the States, but they love the challenge that the States are offering them, and also the challenge that they have to face. And the way they are doing it, in a way, is a little bit, if they want to succeed, is the Matteo Ricci approach. I learn, study, understand, try to become part of the community and not an additional element. Never forget your identity, obviously, neither your food, which is as you know, extremely popular, and try to actually invite many people to your food, but at the end of the day, be part of it. That's what Matteo Ricci did and succeeded. So I want to say how pleased we are that Duilio was able to do this, we did it in a joint venture, as you know, with the Marche, where he comes from. He comes from Macerata. We did it together with the Italian cooperation, because that's one way to show that you can cooperate with a big country like China without imposing just trade. And then, frankly, with Casa Italiana, 
and of which you all guess like I am. So thank you, and let's enjoy a remarkable film which I saw three times already, <laughs> and every time I saw a little angle which was special about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary of State. Um, before we start the screening of the film, I would like to say that for those of you who are standing, there are extra seats in the library on the second floor. There is a flat screen, big TV. It's not a screen like this, but you can be comfortably seated, watch the film upstairs, and maybe come down for the panel discussion at the end. It's up to you. If you want to stand and watch it here, you're free to do that as well. And before we start, I would like to introduce to you Duilio Gianmaria, just ask him to come here and take a bow because he will have time to talk to you uh, at the end of the film when he will meet with the other members of the panel, Federico Rampini, Elisabetta Belloni, and Gerardo Greco that I still don't see. Okay, but Duilio, please come. Please welcome Duilio Gianmaria. unit of Farnesina and I think she happened to be there at the moment where all the crises happened yeah. because her name and her face were on TV every day and she handled some major major uh, situations and um, she I believe was the first in the first class of women admitted to the Liceo Massimo with the Jesuit uh, high school very prestigious Jesuit high school in Rome so she's also an alumna of the Jesuits and of the few generation of women that could enter that sort of elite school. And um, uh, here to my left, we have uh, Federico Rampini, that many of you know, he's the bureau chief for La Repubblica here in New York. Um, Federico Rampini was previously posted on the West Coast in San Francisco, and he also spent a lot of time in China. Uh, he published five years, I thought much more. I connect you to China so much. Maybe it's permanently in Beijing. But you have been going on it and yeah. now can continue. And uh, uh, he wrote several books about his uh, experience uh, in China. Uh, his 2006 book is called The Qingdia Empire. He sort of created this word that is now a, a common word used in Italy by everybody. It's the collapse of uh, China and India together. And uh, Federico is now here uh, in New York. His, um, most, his other book is um, and here, uh, Mao Shadow, published by Knopf, and he recently published a book on the Italian left that we're planning to present here probably as soon as he's done with the presidential elections that he's following, of course, daily for uh, La Repubblica. And uh, we have Luigi Gianmaria, who is a uh, special envoy for uh, the uh, Foreign Services of TG1, uh, the major uh, news uh, program of uh, Rai Television. And, uh, so it's a, a great panel. I would like to start with um, Duilio and ask you, how did you decide to uh, make this film? When did you first start to get interested in, in, in Matteo Ricci, China? And uh, so how, how did the decision to make it came about? And whether you found a fertile ground at Rai when you proposed it to them? <laughs> Thanks very much for the invitation. Yeah, the and, oh. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I didn't, they didn't go to China until very recently. So I wanted, to, I wanted to go to China because I was uh, for a long time in Afghanistan because of all these you know, events in the last 10 years. And once I went over the Pamir uh, Range Mountains and saw China, big, you know, landscape and, and I dreamt to, I really wanted to get inside that country. But uh, uh, Afghanistan taught me that um, in order to understand the country, you need to get deep into the culture. And in fact, China is really the example of how you need to understand the country going deep into the history of, the, of its own identity. And that's why uh, I, I was looking for someone to take me there. And Matteo Ricci took that was the, the first, uh, my first approach, and I really I felt 
Matteo Rich and Hinan, and we walked inside China together, you know. And it was a great experience, of course. And this documentary has been produced by Rai, and it has been shown on Italian television, Italian public television in Enormous, if I recall correctly. Yes. Um, how did you go about proposing it to them? Did they accept it immediately? Uh, how did the regional market get involved in the project? You know how the broadcasters are, and Rai, we have got a, friend, a lot of friends working for Rai uh, in New York and everywhere in the world. They, we know that how the, the, the mainstream media are, you know, they, they don't really like, you know, specific story or a very unknown story. So we had really did a bit to push for it. And uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Regional Market, and all the institutions behind it really helped me to do that. Because uh, at first, uh, it, I, with, they felt that it was not really an audiovisual product. But they really felt that this kind of story is uh, something which is uh, helping also the young generation to be more you know, courageous. To, and to say that the Italians have been doing this kind of traveling and, and having this vision for a long time. And then we have to go back to these roots for in order to maybe you know, to do something better for the future of Italy. And how was it received in Italy? Did you receive emails, letters regarding this, this, uh, this film? How, how, how did people react to it? Um, really, strangely, as, you know, as in... Alexander, excuse me. We need to lower the volume. There is said, unbearable um, feedback. Marco Polo is very famous in Italy. I think it's famous in the States, everywhere in the world. But uh, Marco Polo didn't do much with, for, for exchange of ideas with China. And Matteo Ricci is not well known in, in, in Italy either. Of course, uh, uh, you know, people which went to the Jesuit schools uh, know it very well. But uh, uh, so it was a big surprise. So a lot of people said, come on, is this, uh, is this Matteo Ricci really did the, all this? Uh, all this? He really, you know, translated Confucius in, in Latin. He did translate Aristotle in uh, in uh, Mandarin. He did teach the Chinese that they were they were not the middle of the world. They were not as big as they thought. You know, because most of the these details I didn't have time to put in in the, into, the, into the documentary. But uh, the, th the the things which uh, um, Matteucci did is really something huge, huge. To you know, to me, to make two cultures in a few years come together and understand each other, whereas there was no common ground before. It's like a, working in a big black hole, you know. He, he walked in a, in a place where there was no map to show where he was going. So, huge, huge, huge character. Wonderful. Thank you, Julia. We'll go back to you. And uh, Minister Belloni, two questions. One, as an alumna of the Jesuits. So, the first is, how does Matteo Ricci fit into the history of the Jesuits, the early history of the Jesuits? But also the Jesuits of later generations and of today, their commitment to to dialogue and also to social progress uh, in different parts of the world. Um, did your education with the Jesuits influence you in deciding to become a diplomat? Uh, so this is a first personal question related to your formation and your own personal experience with the Jesuits as the successors of Matteo Ricci. And then I have a question uh, for you regarding your current job. Well, honestly, I don't think that um, studying in uh, the schools of the Jesuits uh, influenced my decision to become a diplomat. I would rather say that uh, uh, definitely when you attend that kind of school, you are forged for your life. This is true. And um, I would say that the choice I made uh, um, was based on the fact that uh, I had a natural tendency for knowing the others, for living uh, somewhere else. And definitely, you know, the Jesuit teach you to adapt to whatever situation you want to, to, to try. And um, probably, you know, the, 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 what I am now is a consequence of what the Jesuit taught me. But at the same time, when you study in those schools, you learn that you become what you allow the others to teach you. It is something that Matteo Ricci probably experienced uh, uh, from the very beginning when he entered China. And we come now to what uh, uh, Matteo Ricci meant uh, 
for the Jesuit at that time of the history of the Society of Jesus. You know, the Society had, uh, was founded uh, only a few years before he entered China. And uh, I think he found a, a sort of natural ground for the Jesuits, you know, a country at that time that was based on culture, on the use of brain, on uh, learning and teaching. For the Jesuit was a sort of really natural ground the world to be. And that's why, you know, the two cultures met so easily because they were really based on the same principle of the use of brain. For whatever purpose, I would dare to say, probably if the Jesuits hear me at this point, they would react. <laughs> but, but I would definitely submit that that was the approach. And uh, this, this culture can really become the common ground. And if yeah. maybe religious faith divides you, but if you talk about geometry, mathematics, it's even astronomy, religion, you find a sort of... I would say that even religion, if you base you know, your faith on the use of intellect, then you respect other religions. And at the same time, you reinforce yours which is something probably difficult nowadays to accept and understand. But uh, I do think that that was the basis for that mutual understanding that Matteo Ricci managed to reach at that time. And which is very, I would say, updated. <laughs> if you look at what's happening around the world now, uh, if you think that the respect for the others, knowledge of what the others can, uh, can give you, knowledge of uh, the values that are around you uh, probably would help us quite a lot today. And uh, another thing that I always discuss when I have uh, these interesting meetings with my friends uh, in the Society of Jesus is that um, they teach you how to become a, relatives, a relativist, uh, which is also something which is... The Pope would have some problem with it. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, but uh, if you realize that your own thinking is good to the extent that uh, uh, you do not know other things that are equally good, then you become a sort of relativist, as I say. And one follow-up question. Things were not that easy for Matrici, neither in China, as we saw, he had many difficulties. He was very stubborn. <laughs> You know, he decided to be there until he got to the imperial court. He didn't fulfill the final point of his mission, it was converting China, but he succeeded in establishing this dialogue, this beautiful dialogue of which we still take advantage today. But he was also uh, considered uh, a sort of a pseudo-heretic within the church and even by some members of the company of Jesus. What did they blame him for? What was wrong with Matteo Ricci according to certain parts of the church? Duilio doesn't talk about this in his documentaries. Yeah. <laughs> he was diplomatic in his sense. <laughs> well, uh, uh, honestly, I don't know at that time what really made uh, his life so difficult. But one thing is, uh, was true at that time, probably, and is true today. Uh, if you put questions to what you are by accepting what the others are proposing, then you risk to be considered as an heretic, and definitely he was, Jesuits are. Look at what's happening today in Syria. I mean, we, we come to today's history, you know, the Jesuits were thrown out from Syria. And uh, this famous Jesuit, uh, Padre Dalloglio, he was received by the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, he was received by Fabius, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France, and he is shouting all around the world. You can find some very interesting interviews with Padre Dallonio on YouTube. Mm -hmm. He has some radical viewpoints yeah. on the situation and, uh, of the Middle East. Very I'm not suggesting that uh, he is proposing uh, the right solution or uh, you know, the right theory about what Syria is today. But definitely the provocative way that the Jesuits are addressing uh, you know, politics rather than uh, faith uh, risks them to consider them heretics, though they are not. And this is one of the reasons why probably uh, uh, by the end of the 18th century, the society was closed to be then reopened in 1814. In fact, it was expelled by the regime, 
uh, the Jesuits were expelling Beijing at the same time they were uh, facing problem in Rome. Yeah. Exactly the same years. Yeah, so. And the, the, it's also interesting that the cause of canonization of Matteo Ricci started in 1984. It was, he died in uh, 1610, so it took the church 270 years to even start considering the possibility that this man might indeed be a saint. And I think one of the things that created more, more problems, but tell me if, you, if I'm wrong, is that uh, for many people within the church, they thought that he went too far in this dialogue, that he was willing to give up too much of uh, his own culture, of his own faith, in order to come to an understanding with, uh, with the Chinese people. And that's something that we now seem to agree that it was not that bad to give up something of who you are in order to enter into a deeper dialogue, but it takes other people a lot of time to understand that that's a... Well, I would submit that uh, Jesuits do not give up what they are, but they allow others to interfere in your growing, which means they allow others to forge your own identity the more you grow which is you know, a, a way to accept uh, that uh, joining uh, different uh, sources of knowledge is good. Yeah, and of course when I said give up something of who you are, not the essence of who you are, he never stopped being a, a priest, a Christian, a Catholic, but you know, give up your uniform, give up like the exterior form of uh, what your religion is about, you know, keep the essence. He had very clear what the essence was, and of course he would not give up. But I tell you a, a, person, that. a personal story that you were just reminded me of. Uh, I was 14 years old, and it was uh, one of my first days in a Jesuit school, and uh, I was really intrigued by this uh, way that they were teaching uh, the Catholic faith. So I uh, asked one of the priests, but can you explain me why we have the true religion and uh, you know a Jew or rather than a Buddhist uh, cannot reach the same uh, uh, illuminated uh, religion and he said well don't bother I mean you know a mountain you have the peak of the mountain you can reach it from a more difficult path an easier one from one side rather than the other one it doesn't matter go ahead <laughs> so this is the way that they teach you how to accept the others Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, there, there's an interesting anecdote in the, in the life of Matteo Ricci that he came in contact with uh, uh, a Jewish community in China, one of these sort of mysterious things. And, and the chief rabbi, at a certain point after a long conversation with Ricci, uh, he was very old, he was aging, and he offered him to become the chief rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Had he given up eating pork. <laughs> and Matteo Ricci decided not to, and I like to think that it's not because of his affection to salami, but thank you also for the respect of who they were. He was saying, you know, I cannot be the leader of a community of which I'm not part. So I think even in that, but it, yet another legendary element, you know, ask, being asked by the chief rabbi of this mysterious Jewish community in China uh, to become the new rabbi. <laughs> that also happened to him. Um, Federico, I think with you we, we want to take a leap forward uh, since you are one now, one of the Italians that knows uh, China better than everybody. Um, well, first of all, as you first got to China, uh, do you, did you feel that this presence of the great Italians like Marco Polo and Matteo Ricci is still present uh, when you introduce yourself as an Italian? Uh, is there a mention of these names or there? part of uh, popular culture in China or the Chinese curriculum, what do people know of them? And then we're going to talk a bit more about China today and, and, and the dialogue between the East and the West is one of your uh, pièces de résistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah? Uh, well, first of all, let me be quite open about my own uh, uh, limitations. Uh, full disclosure, I was not raised by Jesuits. Uh, although I did have uh, Jesuits as a religion teacher uh, in my childhood, in, uh, but not, not in a Jesuit school. Um, uh, instead, I was a communist. Uh, That's your new as, book. We're yeah, not talking when, about when that. When in my 20s in the, in the Italian Communist One Party. One thing does not exclude the other. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I could be on the one. Uh, so, being a 
communists may have uh, provided me with other tools uh, to uh, useful to understand uh, today's China. Um, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the presence of uh, Matteo Ricci and even Marco Polo in uh, the popular culture is uh, as uh, deep and widespread as we would like it to be. I mean, uh, yes, a majority of Chinese, uh, older, younger, uh, know who they, who they are. It's, uh, these two names are certainly among the most uh, well-known. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that the knowledge goes very deep into their history. Uh, as well as it doesn't go deep enough in Italy. And I mean, I would like even to add uh, another uh, part of this story that uh, we tend to ignore, and this is typical Eurocentrism, uh, or in this case, uh, Italocentrism, because in between these two very important characters, Marco Polo and uh, Matteo Ricci, there's another history right in the middle, uh, when the Chinese visited us. This happened in 1433 in Florence, under the rule of the Medici's. And it's an incredibly important visit, uh, because uh, it was a, an, an official delegation from China with a lot of, uh, not only political leaders, but uh, diplomats, but uh, scientists. And at that time, China was uh, much more advanced uh, than us uh, in terms of uh, science and technology, especially for navigation. Uh, the, their instruments of measuring latitude and longitude uh, were, were much more precise than ours. This is why the, the Admiral Cheng He was able to uh, organize uh, expeditions, explorations uh, into uh, East Africa. Uh, Indonesia, maybe even South America. It is disputed, but there's a it, there's indeed a, this possibility. So, 1433, they come to Florence. Uh, they bring their knowledge, uh, and there is a very important Italian astronomer, Toscanelli, who uh, picks uh, all the knowledge, uh, all the useful knowledge from the Chinese, and then Toscanelli himself is. Uh, indispensable to Cristoforo Colombo and Amerigo Vespucci. So maybe we would never have uh, uh, discovered America <laughs> without uh, copying Chinese software. <laughs> that's, that's, but it's true. This is really true. And this might be the topic for another uh, documentary. <laughs> so uh, one more thing I would like to, uh, to add. I myself was completely fascinated by Matteo Ricci because of this, uh, of his belief that it is possible to explain China to us and to explain the West uh, to China, the West being mostly Christianity, the Christian culture at that time. Um, what, what's even more interesting is how uh, the knowledge of China that Matteo Ricci spread in Europe uh, fascinated probably the most important philosopher of the Enlightenment and one of the inspirators of the French Revolution, Voltaire. Voltaire was fascinated by that China that Matteo Ricci had explained to the Europeans because he saw into that China a much more advanced model of state, public administration, where the uh, high bureaucrats, the mandarins, were selected by examinations through tests, national tests. This did not happen in, in France at that time. Uh, the high rankings in the public administration were simply sold. The king sold them for money. Uh, so it was mostly uh, aristocrats who could buy those. So Voltaire uh, was uh, uh, deeply uh, in love with this uh, model of 
China. So he, he admired China he admired through Matteo through Matteo Ricci, through what Matteo Ricci, he knew China only and exclusively through Matteo Ricci, and he thought that China was a much more advanced kind of uh, uh, state and public administration than France and the other European kingdoms. Uh, did and I answer your yes, question? Yes, you, you answered my question perfectly. <laughs> And uh, now it's a question of, about you and you getting to China and how did your love affair with China, that is a love affair with China there, started. And as you said, and it's also part of your, of your new book about the, the, the left, the crisis of the left in Italy, but not only in Europe and in America. So how does a former communist at the time when you went to China, were you already considered yourself a former communist? And how was your approach to China when you got there? What interested you from the beginning? And did your range of interests change during your time there? I mean, were there things that fascinated you before you got there? And did your interests change while you were living your situation there? It's a much, uh, it's much too long. So <laughs> I'll try to just pick part of just it. Just give us a preview. Uh, we're going to talk about that I mean, in greater uh, detail when we do the, your book. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, because I had been a communist in Italy with a completely different kind of communism, uh, still I was fascinated by China a long time ago because uh, uh, it was one of the two communist uh, churches uh, in the world. There was the Soviet Union and then the Schismatic Church of China, uh, which had inspired uh, a lot of uh, radical leftists in Europe, more in France than in, uh, than in Italy. But I grew up also in France uh, uh, when I was young. So in France you had all these uh, uh, ultra-leftists like Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, um, um, Roland Barthes, of course, uh, others who became uh, conservatives like Philippe Solers, uh, they were all Maoists. They were all youth. the red booklet. Right? Yes, all of them read the, 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 the red uh, book of Mao. So there, there was this influence of uh, Mao Zedong and uh, uh, Communist China uh, on the most uh, radical left in Europe in uh, May 68. It was very, very, very powerful. Uh, but the most recent part of, it, of my story with China starts when I was based in, on the West Coast uh, in San Francisco. At that time I covered, as a reporter, uh, the negotiations between the final negotiations between the US and China for the entry of China in the WTO, yeah. which is really somehow the beginning of what we now call globalization, the, the beginning of the, the final chapter or the most recent chapter. So that was uh, very interesting for me. And then, so I was commuting between San Francisco and Beijing. And then I lived in Beijing. I was based in Beijing for five years. That was between 2004 and 2009. Uh, and I'm I'm still in love with China, uh, and I'm still deeply worried by the Chinese political system. And I think that we should all be worried, uh, because uh, this is partly due to the heritage of uh, communism, Chinese style. Uh, we are seeing, just in, in the latest uh, days, uh, uh, the, the most recent news, first of all, uh, the tension in the East China Sea between China and Japan regarding a few islands, uh, contested islands, uh, where in, in the nearby sea there are offshore uh, oil uh, resources. Uh, and uh, together with those uh, tensions, uh, um, the demonstrations uh, uh, of uh, young, angry crowds uh, in Beijing and Shanghai, anti-Japanese demonstration. That reminds me, I, I also saw uh, anti-Japanese demonstrations when I lived in China. Uh, I think it's worrying because uh, such a powerful country as China uh, still seems uh, almost incapable of uh, um, expressing 
soft power. They show their muscles too much. And the young people who demonstrate uh, with such angry tones in the streets of Beijing and Shanghai against the Japanese, I, I think that basically they are in search of any pretext to uh, vent their anger because they cannot demonstrate against their own government. The other very recent development has been the, the strikes at Foxconn, which is the plant, the very large electronic company that where Apple has outsourced the assembly of <laughs> iPads, iPods, iPhones. Uh, and, and this is also another, uh, another sign of uh, social tension. I mean, uh, uh, workers' uh, unrest, uh, workers' uh, uh, anger at the uh, working conditions, uh, salary, low salaries, uh, uh, exploitation, uh, uh, overtime uh, in uh, most uh, uh, Chinese factories. And uh, that, that, that's also a sign that uh, that kind of government, that kind of political system is not uh, apt to respond to all the new needs of the Chinese society. Is there something more that the West could do to understand China, to enter into a dialogue, and somehow also to influence uh, somehow the working conditions of people in China, or these uh, recent movements that you just described are what is really going to change the situation there. I mean, is there a role of the West in all this, or we just should like sit down, lay back, and wait for the Chinese to finally get tired of not going on holidays and not having paid sick leave and, and all that? Uh, in the end, China will be changed by the Chinese. There's no doubt about that. We have very little influence, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that we must uh, give up. I think we, uh, we must uh, speak loud. And this is, I, I, going back to Matteo Ricci, this is really where Matteo Ricci is important and his legacy is so important. Uh, and here I, 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 I sense a, a kind of dissent about your definition of uh, relativism. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that Matteo Ricci was a relativist uh, in the sense that we give to this word today. Uh, relativism, relativism today is uh, one of the ideology that has been embraced uh, by the Chinese leaders. You know, when, when I lived in China, and uh, very often I had discussions with uh, the Chinese about human rights, uh, or, or even more important, when the Chinese uh, leaders uh, felt uh, that they were lectured by American presidents uh, or European leaders uh, or uh, human rights activists uh, about uh, freedom of speech, the lack of freedom of speech in China, uh, persecution of dissidents uh, and so on, persecution of uh, religious minorities, including Catholics, in today's China. The typical answer from the Chinese leaders is a very relativist answer. They, they tell us uh, that liberal democracy, freedom of speech, pluralism of political parties, free elections are very good, and they respect them, are very good for us. These are Western values, valid only for Western countries, and we should not try to impose them on countries that come from a very different tradition with the other cultural uh, roots uh, and so on. Uh, I think this is a fake ideology. I think this is uh, the, the ideological uh, justification and basis for uh, the rule of a single party in China and uh, the uh, unrestricted, uh, unchecked power of an oligarchy. Uh, so we should not accept this kind of relativism uh, and uh, the students, uh, the Chinese students 
who died uh, in the streets of Tiananmen Square in 1989 were not relativist. They, were, they believed that uh, human rights, freedom of speech, and democracy are universal values. They are also Chinese values. This, I think, is the true Matteo Ricci. He believed that di dialogue is possible if there can be common values. If different cultures and different civilizations uh, are separate entities, uh, dialogue is impossible. I, I think that the, the most important uh, lesson of Matteo Ricci is that he believed that he could explain China and Confucius to Western uh, readers uh, and explain Christian religion to the Chinese because he believed there was something in common. Thank you very much, Federico. Uh, I think we, we can open now the floor to uh, questions. And there are seats here. There are four seats here. So the people are standing in the back. You can take seats. There are seats here in front row. Don't stand. Come, sit down. Enjoy. Yes, ma'am. Writing on what you just said, uh, the, uh, the Chinese leaders who re respond in this relativist fashion, do they have uh, do they deal with the contradiction that China has gobbled up arguably the worst of the West, the hyper-consumerism and the um, hyper-ambition and competitiveness, but not the better parts of the West, and then connecting this to the theme of the evening. Um, where does criticism of China, in terms of lacking democracy, come from in Italy, does it come from the left or does it come from the right? Uh, in, in this country, uh, most of the criticism of, of China from that point of view, unfortunately, comes from our right and not from our left. So those are two questions. Thank you. Yeah, very quickly, um, first the second one. Uh, no, I, I would say that in, in Italy, criticism of China comes both from the left and the right, maybe. Uh, there was a time uh, when uh, in the Italian right the criticism was mostly for uh, trade uh, reasons uh, uh, like uh, unfair competition, uh, piracy issues, copyright issues, uh, whereas the left was maybe more active on the human right, but mostly it's, uh, there's a common ground I would say. Um, the, 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 the other question, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that uh, China, today's China, has taken only the worst from the West, because if you ask the Chinese people, the fact that uh, by embracing uh, the market economy in the last 30 years, China was able to lift from poverty, probably more than 400 million people uh, that, is a ma that is a major achievement, and it, it, is, uh, it is, human rights are also, include also the right uh, uh, to be free from poverty. Uh, so th this is really, I, I think it's widely recognized that this has been a contribution of contemporary China to human rights in the world. Even a non-Chinese, uh, an Indian, uh, of Indian origin, Nobel Prize of Economics, uh, who teaches at Harvard University here in the US, Amartya Sen, would, uh, he, he recently wrote a, a beautiful piece on the New York Review of Books uh, uh, comparing China, uh, an authoritarian government, with India, the largest democracy in the world, in terms of uh, uh, longevity, reduction of infant mortality, pro progress of literacy, and especially literacy among women, Amartya Sen, who is no, really not uh, sympathetic of the Chinese government, writes that China is better than India. So let, let's not forget the big picture. The, uh, uh, economic progress is beneficial, and it has uh, uh, really uh, even provided the Chinese population with huge benefits and even even some kind of freedom if we compare today China today's China with Mao Maoist communist China 
they are now free to travel abroad, to choose their own uh, school, their own job. That was not uh, up to them during the Mao regime. Uh, the Communist Party would uh, select for them the school, the job, uh, the region of China where they should live. Uh, some of them were deported into the countryside during the Cultural Revolution. They, they, they could not even choose their garments. They, they all wear the same, they, they had to wear the same uniform. So in terms of personal freedom, sexual freedom, um, the, the freedom of consumption of uh, what kind of, whatever the, the music they like today, they can do it. They could not listen to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones in the 60s. It was censored. So the, even f that kind of personal freedom have uh, increased uh, dramatically in China. The, the real obstacle is political freedom and therefore freedom of speech, uh, also freedom of uh, religion. The, there are religions uh, that are oppressed, especially Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Islam in the Uyghur minorities in Xinjiang and those Catholic those Catholics who still recognize the Pope as the authority of the church are persecuted. Grazie Federico. I think do you want yeah. to add something? Uh, of course I, I, I'm not uh, in, in any condition to, to, to be more um, criticize uh, what, what uh, Federico just said, but uh, um, you know, let me say something about the fact that we also by watching uh, and, and analyzing China, we have to be careful in what we, we say, let's go to religion uh, freedom for instance. You know, I've got the feeling that uh, the system of, of, of the political system there, uh, Federico just referred to the last 30, 40 years, goes very deep into the millennium. The new, the, for instance, the, the, the new leadership has discovered Confucianism, you know, which is something like a good rule of law, good, uh, good sense of morality, something like that, you know. And they, they never got really involved into religion. You know, they, they got contact and they've been a Buddhist country, they've been Taoist, they've been Confucian sort of religion. And all of all the three religions which were known at the time, Jews, little community, also some uh, Nestorians, which were sort of uh, old, old, old uh, Catholics, they had the, the possibility to stay <coughs> and, to, and to be there as long as they wouldn't touch the, 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 the let's, what we call the social contract. You know, uh, they, had, they would accept, I think, uh, much more the, the Catholics if the Catholics were not saying uh, so, as, as they say most of the time, you know, something about uh, birth control, uh, all these kind of uh, values which, which are, of course, involved in, in our culture, but they don't, they don't feel that they, 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 it's not good to accept them, because it does not uh, uh, come to the, to, into the political uh, system. They have a different identity. And we have to be, maybe honestly, uh, you said that you were a communist uh, when you were young, and, and um, maybe we still have in our own culture the, the, the artifact of being ideolized, ide ideologized in a way. Something like uh, to, to have a, a blueprint to put on a country, and which explains the country. Nowadays, we have discovered something which is much more complicated. You know, we cannot analyze and describe exactly what's going on in the financial world. You know, who can they, who, who can they say something to, which ex will explain the financial crisis nowadays. Are the, the city bank or the, uh, the, the, the federal bank or the euro banks be able to touch this problem? Are we able to, to deal with this problem really? I mean, do we have a, a system which are, is able, is a capacity to deal with this problem? And let me go the way back to Matteo Ricci. Maybe new, res the new Renaissance method will work better. In a sense that uh, Matteo Ricci blend a lot of different science together. Of course, there was the, th the theology. Of course, there was astronomy, geography, arts. Everything was was like a, a like a melting pot. 
to try to explain a very, very difficult, you know, and, and, and enrichable uh, truth. You know, there's a Jesuit uh, at, at, the, at the archive say, we understood for the first time now, nowadays, in the first 50 years, that we as European, you as Americans, or we, we, cannot, we are not able to, to reach out, to have the understanding of the world. And we understood that we, we are not able to, with our own culture, to explain everything. So, you know, maybe we go back to the sense of what the, you said about uh, relativism. But I, I, I don't know if I was clear what I said. I'd like to come back to this issue of the relativism because I grasped uh, some comments by Federico. I think he explained very well what uh, what dialogue meant uh, in uh, in Matteo Ricci's view. Dia logos. Dia logos means uh, the search of truth, and in that sense, rel relativism means accepting that others have a way to reach the truth. It does not mean uh, what probably uh, I was not clear before. Uh, it does not mean that uh, you have, uh, you can accept everything and that uh, the true values or the principles that we can share as she <coughs> was trying to do with the Chinese uh, culture are not uh, uh, worth to be pursued in absolute terms. So you explained it very, very clearly. But in this way, you cannot say that the Chinese government or the Chinese <coughs> leaders are relativist. On the contrary, I would say that they really look for the absolute truth, thinking that that is the only one. So I would slightly disagree with the comment that you related to the explanation of uh, relativism. And the other comment I wanted to make refer to the question you put to Federico, whether we can contribute to a change in China. Of course, Chinese will develop their own future, and this is uh, probably the way it will, uh, it will materialize. But on the other hand, I think we have to reflect on the fact that uh, whether we like it or not, globalization has an implication in the sense that interdependence is so evident in all relations that uh, we should ask ourselves whether it will be only China that will develop its own future or whether even indirectly we will contribute in an interdependent world to the change of China itself. That is a question I do not have the answer, but I tend to feel that the effect of globalization does imply that uh, in a way or another we will have a role to play. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Belloni. Uh, we don't have any more time. I understand we only took one question from the floor, but now we have a toast upstairs to the film by Luigi Gian Maria. So join us upstairs for a glass of wine, San Parmigiano, and we continue our discussion. I think it's very important that our discussion was not an historical discussion of Matteo Ricci, but the main issue we tackled was relativism and dialogue and how the two things are related. I think it's perfectly Ricciano in essence and substance that our conversation was drawn to these uh, focal points. And I think it's also very good to close not with an answer but with a question. It's perfectly in line with Matteo Ricci. Thank you to Luigi Gian Maria, Elisabetta Belloni and Federico Rampino.